Well, today we are continuing in our honor series, and today we are honoring our teenagers, and specifically our graduates, but teenagers uh, as a whole. Every week I've read uh, some things about that group that we're honoring and asked them if, if they would or could relate to anything that's being said. They would stand up at that time. So teenagers, I'm going to read something that I wrote that is entitled, uh, What Would Happen If Teens Ran the Church? Okay, and if this is something that you think would be a great idea for our church, you just stand up, and then at the end, uh, all of you will be standing, and we want to honor you today, okay? So what would happen if teens ran the church? Number one, Wednesday night suppers would be catered by Taco Bell. Number two, communion would be taken using bagel bites and energy drinks and be set up on a glow-in-the-dark ping-pong table. Number three, the youth budget line item would be larger than the national debt. Number four, sweater vests would be outlawed forever. That's not funny. Sit down on that one. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The sanctuary would be converted into a gigantic skateboard park with GoPros mounted everywhere. Number six, Sean Mendez would be your worship leader. Corey, you're out. And the sermon would be given by that dad off the show Fresh Off the Boat. Number seven, all sermon videos will be played over virtual reality goggles. Number eight, offering plates will be passed by drones. That's pretty dangerous. Number nine, Forget the name life groups. We're going to have lit groups. Number 10, Pastor Greg becomes bruh Greg. Number 11, you who are working the visitors area, throw away those stupid coffee cups. All guests would receive a special promo fidget spinner with our church logo on it. Number 12, worship services would be at night when we wake up and all Bible study classes would be over Snapchat. Number 13, the organ and the piano in the sanctuary will be traded in for two turntables, a guitar, and a cowbell. Number 14, all chairs would be replaced by couches, or better yet, video rockers, and all lights extinguished so that we can all use our personal laser pointers, which would be all over me right now, everywhere. And finally... If teenagers ran the church, due to the skateboards in the front porch of the Coac, the marshmallow gun wars in the sanctuary, footballs in the gym, and lock-ins in the Knox building, Miss Nancy would have to be admitted to the psych ward at Piedmont Medical for the rest of her life, strung out on the highest anxiety drugs known to man. If you're a teenager in the room, please stand up. We honor you. We honor you. Stay standing. Stay standing for just a minute. We honor you. Acts chapter 2 verse 17 says, In the last days when God will pour out His Spirit on all nations, and young men and young women will prophesy in His name, and young men will have dreams, and we look forward to the day, Wade, when you're pounding the pulpit, and Andrew, you're designing all of this, and Ellie and Jaden and Tristan are leading the praise and worship songs. We look forward to the day when you're in charge, and I want to say that now before I get too crotchy to admit it. I'm looking forward to the day when you're in charge. I honor you today because I value you today and I respect what God is doing in you today. You may be seated. Please be honored today. I got all preachy too fast. Now it's just going to be downhill from here. Sorry about that. When the honor series we are uh, holding uh, Romans 12:10 exceptionally, especially close to our heart today, uh, we are honoring one another with with love and esteem. We are treating each other with value and respect. In fact, that's our definition for this series: is uh, honor is defined as seeing value and respect, both of them, in other people. And so today, we want to honor our teenagers. I want you to know that we honor you teenagers because God intends on using you to change the world. He's always depended on young people to do his work and to change the world. If you would turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1, we'll be in a couple of passages today. We're going to start out with Jeremiah chapter 1, starting with verse 4. 
And teenagers, take this to heart today. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Verse 6. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. And do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. According to verse 5, you were formed with a purpose. He uses the word consecrated here. Consecrated is the word uh, and what it really means is uh, honored. Even God's honoring you. It means honored, sanctified, holy, set up for something special. And that was before you were ever formed. Before two cells ever met. God had a purpose and a plan for you. And he will honor that. That's the reason for the Great Commission. That's the reason that we're, that we're sent out, especially youth, are sent out to, to share the gospel and proclaim his name and, and the good news of what he offers us. You were consecrated for that task. But you are also, according to verse 5, appointed to be the voice to the nations. Of, you were appointed to be the voice to the nations. That word appointed means to commit or to entrust the responsibility of. You were appointed for this purpose, to be a voice to the nations. That's why Acts 2.17 is absolutely spot on correct. God will lay out his plan in latter days, and young men and young women will be his voice, will prophesy to the nations. Now take note, you are appointed. You're not elected. You are appointed. None of us in the room says, okay, we think you'll be good at this, and we think you'll be good at this. You can take politics all the way out of the picture because you're not elected. You are appointed to be the voice to the nations. We have a, a pretty um, strict, unwritten missions policy in our church concerning uh, age appropriateness of missions. We have always kind of said it's not written, but we've always kind of said that our children would participate in missions on the city level and then maybe the state level. And that our youth could be sent out on a, on a national level. And then our college students and our adults would be sent to the rest of the world. And I want to tell you that's a, a, a pretty good policy, except that God commands that youth uh, has set up, has consecrated, appointed youth, youth to be voices to the nations. It's a pretty good policy because we want to protect you. We want to, uh, to guard you and guard your life and not put you in harmful situations. That's kind of our job. But God says, I am pointing you to be voices to the nations. For that reason, a teenager can go into an IMB website or a North American Mission Board website and sign up for an assignment over the summer, over a break, and, and go do uh, missions with another group or even by themselves under the supervision of a missionary there on, on the field. And, and we want to guide you. We want to guard you and protect you. But God says, I want to use you. Be the voice to the nations. I encourage you to get on those sites. And look where you can be used. You know, there are teenagers over Christmas who will be going and playing ping pong in parks in, uh, in China and starting relationships and sharing their faith in China. There are others who are going and, and mapping out trails in, in uncharted places so that missionaries know exactly how to get to people groups. And teenagers are doing that. I encourage you to be a part of that. You were made with a purpose. You were appointed to the nations. Now put those two things together. You're appointed, you have, you've been consecrated, and now you have this purpose. 
And I gotta tell you that we don't ever think about this, but our driving factor, the the great commission that leads us to do these things, uh, that sets up our mission and our vision, the driving factor is what happened when Jesus, uh, what Jesus said right before the ascension, when he said, the great commission, I want you to go into all the world and spread the gospel and baptize in my name and teach them my commands. I want you to do that. Here's the, the kicker. Here's the kicker. We think that was the beginning of our commission, and that's not true. Because the Bible says that in your spiritual and physical DNA, I placed that before you were born. So the Great Commission is a reminder. It's not a first-time charge. It's already built in us. It's in our being. It's in our DNA. And the Great Commission is a reminder that we have purpose. We have an appointment from God himself. And because of that, verse 8 says he has our back. He's got our back. We'll do almost anything as we know if we know that our supervisor is behind us and pushing us. We will be bold and we will be courageous and we'll go do it as long as we know that someone's behind us. I want you to know you can be bold and courageous with the gospel because this verse says that God has your back. He will go with you. He will not let them overtake you. He has your back. Now turn over to Proverbs chapter 2. That's your charge. Here's your response. Here's a a teenager's response who is following God. Proverbs chapter 2. Several little things that we'll glean out of this, but you know that a teenager's proper response is, Teach me, Lord. Just, Just teach me. I'm young. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what to say. You're going to put me in front of adults all over the world. You're going to have to teach me something. Teach me, Lord. All right, let's look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to learn that uh, God's going to give us knowledge and wisdom. Teach me knowledge and wisdom. Verse 1, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and then you will find the knowledge of God. Uh, my question to you is, what, what are you searching for? Teenagers, you're searching. You're searching for friends. You're searching for identities. You're searching for things to do. You're searching for an escape. You're searching for a release of your talents and your skills, a place to serve. You're searching, and I know you're searching, but what are you most searching for? It should be, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, because you set me up. You set me up with a great purpose and a great plan, and i got to know how to do it, so teach me, Lord. What are you learning? What are you looking for? What part of your life are you, are you all in? Francis Chan has a great illustration, and I would so use it this morning, but it's plagiarism, so I'm just telling you, it came from Francis Chan. He has this rope, and it stretches way off stage, and so it's like, to, it's supposed to represent your life, the eternity of your life, so there's no ending down there. There's a beginning, but there's no ending. So he's holding this rope, and he says, this represents your life, and he painted a red part on the front of it, the, the front of the rope. looks about like this long, about three inches, okay? And he says, and this part is the part that's on earth, The rest of it is for eternity. This part is a part on earth. And what we do as humans is focus on this three inches instead of the rest of it. We build for what's going to happen here. We plan for what's going to happen here. We look forward to what's going to happen here with no regard whatsoever for the rest of the rope. Things that we do here will affect eternity. And we have to have that in in mind while we're we're dealing with this part of, of our lives. We just have to. So in that part of our lives, we're seeking and we're searching and we're learning. Teach me, Lord. Teach me knowledge. Teach me wisdom. Verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. I love that. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of the saints. 
I wanted you to know that that shield is a very big deal for us. It's one of the spiritual weapons that's listed in Ephesians. It's the, the shield of faith. That shield is a big deal, and I love shields. I, I like it when people use them as decoration on their walls, the shield with the, the spears and all that, because it reminds me that my faith is protecting me. And I just like the idea of a shield anyway, just to carry it. I wish that was just socially acceptable, just to carry a shield around in clover. I walk over to Victoria's. How y'all doing? <laughs> Having the shield on, you know? I, I, love, I see myself as the 301 Spartan. I really do, except all those guys are really cut. But there's a thing on, on Pinterest that I love. It's, a, a, it's goat wire. It's some fat guys are sitting around. They took some goat wire, real tight Goat wire is the fencing that's in squares for those of you who are not rednecks. Goat wire, and, and they press it on their bellies for like three minutes. Just press it real hard, and when they take it off, it looks like they have a six pack. It's really awesome. That's what they do, so that's what I'd have to do. I'd have to have my, my goat wire and my shield, and, and I'd just be just, just, just doing things with my shield, and I'd just hit them, and uh, who am I kidding? I could never be a Spartan. I couldn't. They got the coolest names. They got Xerxes and, and Leonidas. I would probably be Orida because <laughs> I love frozen hash browns. So I know that. I know that's true. I'm, I could never be a Spartan. I know that. But I would love to have that shield. And in fact, I do. I do have a shield. And it's God. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity means that he will keep the arrows from the enemy from hitting your vital parts. It, it's kind of tricky, though, because the shield's usually not full length. I know some of those Romans, they had those full-length shields, and they would slam it down on the ground, so you couldn't touch any of them. But most folks only had the circle or the, the, the classic emblem of, of a shield, and, and so their feet and legs were vulnerable. That's why Proverbs wrote, Ponder the paths of your feet, and then your way will be sure. You see, your, your vital organs are protected, but your, your feet are not. So you have to watch where you walk and where you go. But I have a shield, and it's God. And if I try to live life out of integrity, then the things that would be the most damaging to me are going to be reflected and, and thrown to the side. Now, I may still have some injuries and some extremities, but the main part of my life is intact. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. That's why some people who live boldly for the gospel suffer injury and suffer harm. Another part of Proverbs says that if you try to rebuke someone, rebuke someone who is a scoffer or a mocker, that you will incur abuse. You will incur harm. The Proverbs promises that. And so, or they, they tell us that. Remember, Proverbs aren't promises. Remember, we talked about that last week. But I have the shield. I have the shield, and so these things are reflected. I gotta watch the way I'm walking. I gotta watch the enemy, but God is my shield. I wanna ask you a question are you in a place where you allowing God to shield your life? Or are you just standing wide open, waiting wide-eyed for the world to experience all they have to offer? I want to tell you, if you do that, you're setting yourself up for hurt and for disappointment. Because that's the way of the world. If you are one of his, if you are a saint, if you're one of the ones that are saying, teach me, Lord, you will need that shield because there's some things that you do not need to experience. There's some things that are going to happen in college. There's some things that are going to happen in your sororities and your fraternities. There's some things that are going to happen at the rave and the party that you just never have to experience. You don't have to experience those things. God never says, I want you to experience the worst things in life. You don't have to experience those things. Use that shield. If you're saying, teach me, Lord, use that shield because there's some things that you don't want to learn. All right, verse 12. You're also saying, teach me, Lord, to avoid some traps. And he lists just a couple of traps here for teenagers. They're especially true for teenagers. So what, I'm not going to harp on them too long, but I do have to mention them. Verse 12. 
delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Trap number one is hanging out with the exact wrong crowd, making friends with the wrong people. Now, we do have to make friends with the world to some extent. How are we, we going to share the gospel if we, don't, if we don't have a relationship with someone? So you do got to make some friends, but there's got to be some healthy boundaries. Hanging out with the wrong crowd is, is pretty dangerous. There's a, there's a craze right now, and, and it's being pushed by the company Blackstone for flat-top grilling. Have you seen those flat-top grills from Blackstone? Well, I don't have a black stone, but I bought a camp stove a few years ago, and I got this big, this, this big um, flat top grill, this skillet type thing that sits on top of it. It's a two burner, it's huge, and I bought it because I love to cook uh, breakfast. And I love to cook breakfast outside when we're camping, especially. That's one of my favorite things. But this big old griddle, I can cook pancakes and sausage and eggs and hash browns. I can cook all of it all at the same time, and it's awesome. It's got my hash browns going, got eggs going. I even throw some peppers and onions on there and got them going. And, and I get all that stuff happening. That smoke is rising up, and everyone in the campground is just dying because it smells so good. I admit it smells great. Problem is, is that smell is with me the entire rest of the day. It, it sets into your clothes, it gets in your hair and your pores, and you smell like sausage all day long. That's the thing. Whatever you cook, that's what you're gonna smell like if you're cooking on a flat top grill. If you cook bacon, you're gonna smell like bacon. Cook eggs, does eggs really have a smell? You're gonna smell like an egg. And that's not us all cracked up to be. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Sorry. All right. But whatever you're cooking, that's going to that's gonna influence how you smell to other folks. It's the exact same way with your circle of friends. Your circle of friends have a smell. <laughs> not literally, but figuratively. They have a, a, a reputation. They have a, a, a way they like to do things. They have a smell. People recognize their, that what they do and recognize their work and how they operate. And if you hang out with them long enough, then the same reputation, the same, the same um, mode of operation will be applied in their understanding to you no matter if you do it or not. No matter if you're involved with them or not. If people see you with them, they're going to assume that you are also doing those things with them. So you got to watch this trap. You got to have a relationship with them. You got to share the gospel. You got to encourage them. You got to point them towards Jesus. But you also got to have some kind of barrier, some kind of shield so that that doesn't get stuck to you. Does that make sense? That's a trap. You got to be careful. Trap number two, verse 16. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Trap number two, entering a physical relationship outside of marriage is a trap. I want you to hear me. It is a trap. A physical relationship outside of marriage, not only is it sinful in the eyes of God, but it is a trap. I liken to a physical relationship outside of marriage um, to Gorilla Glue. Hear me out. Hear me out. Gorilla Glue, when it's in the tube can handle it, it's great. Gorilla Glue, when it's already dried, you can handle it, it's awesome. Gorilla Glue, fresh out of the tube, will jack you up. I'm not kidding. If you think I'm kidding, go ahead and glue with Gorilla Glue the soles of your feet together like that and just see what happens. You will never walk again. <laughs> if you could rip them apart, it would be a ripping apart. And that's exactly one of the great things about a physical relationship in marriage. It's like Gorilla Glue. It 
puts you together and, and forms you together. And there's a bond that's really tight there. And it's great if, if it happens in the bonds uh, or in the confines of a marriage. But if it doesn't, then you've got this bond that's not supposed to be a bond yet. And if that ends, which it probably will, now you've got this just ripping, tearing breakup of a relationship and you'll never be the same again. That's why it's so dangerous. I ask you to reserve yourself in a physical, in your physical bodies for the right moment with the right person. I promise you, I promise you will not go well if you do not because I've been there and it's not good. So learn, learn from God. Take the knowledge, take the wisdom, take the shield. Watch out for those traps and say, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, so I will succeed and not get in a place where I'm not supposed to be or around friends that are gonna make me stink. Get me in a place where I need to be. Verse 20, teach me so I can succeed. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous for the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Listen to God, learn from God, succeed in your purpose from God. Ignore God, stiff arm God and you will never accomplish what he has for you. It's very important to learn from God so that you can succeed. And success in God's eyes is, is quite different than success in the world's eyes or even success in your parents' eyes and your grandparents' eyes. Succeed in what God has for you and everything else will be fine. Well, if you look in your bulletin, if you look in your bulletin, there's a report card I'm asked that we all take this report card and apply it to our lives, but especially teenagers. Teenagers, if you would remember 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, uh, don't let anybody look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in life, faith, and purity. Okay? Speech conduct oh speech conduct love faith and purity sorry speech conduct love faith and purity now ask yourself first and I encourage you to go write just write it right now write it there's something about seeing it on paper that makes it become real in your life you don't have to share it with anybody you don't have to don't don't even be looking at anybody else's writing you just go ahead and say it are you setting the example are you setting the example for other believers yes or no just check it, yes or no. Are you setting the examples for other believers? When you go to the party, when you go and hang out, when you go on a date, when you're going to church, when you're hanging around your grandparents, when you're, are you setting an example for all of them of what Christ, what God is teaching you? Are you setting that example? You're supposed to be. You're supposed to be setting that example. Are you doing it? And look at it. You see okay, I, I'm not doing this so well. Or okay, I, I'm doing okay with this. I need, I need further teaching. Now, grade yourself on the five spiritual aspects of this verse. The spiritual subjects of this verse. Speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. Write it down. A through F. Are you, are you doing well with your speech? Are, are, you, are you encouraging? Are you using your speech the way God wants you to? To encourage, to share the gospel, to build people up, to condemn sin, to, to condemn false gospels, to stand up for righteousness? Give yourself a grade. Do it. Give yourself a grade on your conduct. How is your behavior? How, 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 is, your, how is your actions? How, how are people taking those? Give yourself A through F. Write it down. Give yourself your grade on, on your ability to love. Are you sharing truth in love? Are you esteeming others more than yourself? Are you building them up more than your own reputation? A through F, give yourself a grade on love. How about your faith? 
Give yourself a, a letter grade on how you're building your faith up. Are you reading, are you reading the Word? Are, are you studying what people are saying about the Word? Are, are you going to your Bible classes? Are, are you listening and learning? And, and are, how are you growing in your faith? Give yourself an A through F grade. Do it. How about your purity? Grade yourself A through F on your purity. Are you allowing impure things to enter into your mind, to go through your eyes, go through your ears and invade your body? Or are you keeping a pretty strong grasp on what's coming in and able to reflect or deflect? Give yourself that letter grade. Now look at your grades. You do this, some of you students do this all the time. You're looking at your grades. You want to know, okay, is this the, the weekend that I lose my life? <laughs> or, or is this the weekend I'm going to get to go out and have some fun? So you're looking at your grades. You do it all the time. I'm asking everybody to do that. Look at your grades. Look at your spiritual grades. Where are you? Do you need to pull it up? Are you doing pretty good or do you need to pull it up? Oh, that's tough to look at. I know. That's tough to look at. That's, that is, that's a hard thing to do. But it's a good thing to do. Because if you want to graduate with a certain grade point average so that you can get into the right school or get the right scholarship or get the right help financially, you know, you got to have that whatever it is, 3.5 or whatever, whatever it is. And so you're looking all that year, you're saying, all right, I got to make an A in this class. I got to make a B in this class. If I don't, I'm going to fall down. You, you do that, right? You do that. We, we all did that in school. I'm inviting you to do that in, in your spiritual walk. Look at your grades. Okay, I, I want to maintain this level. I, I want to please God with this life. How, how can I pull this grade up? What can I do to pull, to pull this grade up in my speech, in my conduct? What, what can I do? You got to do that. If you never challenge yourself, it's not going to get any better. So I honor you today. Teenagers, I honor you. And I wasn't blowing smoke a while ago. I, I'm really looking forward to you being up here and me learning right there and worshiping right there and going on a mission trip under your leadership. I look forward to that. And I want that to happen. So I'm begging you, please learn. Seek the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Please learn. Please learn for our sakes. We're giving you the very best we can. And I just ask you to do the same for us. We're looking to you for the future. Let's pray. Father, um, I know you have a great affinity for students. I've always believed that. Um, primarily because of your word. You know, you, you set up teenagers through your word all the time to, to minister and to do your work and to change the world and I, I know you've always done that you just have you have an affinity for for youth and for energy and for boldness and for innocence and, and you've you've taken that group of folks and you have changed the world and you are going to continue to change the world and I ask that you would help us to pray for them to lift them up to encourage them to yes correct at times but to encourage all the more and I ask that you would help them to see their spiritual significance on the world and not chase after things that would just simply enhance their existence for today, but to chase after things that will indeed allow you to help them to change the world. And one day they will lead us. One day my grandkids will be in their youth group. And... My family will be worshiping at their leading. And I will be sitting under their teaching. I know you have great things in store for us when that happens. It's exciting. God, I ask that you would help us to plan for that day and not the first three inches of our life, but the rest of our life as well. God, I, I pray you will use this to grow your kingdoms. In Christ's name we pray. Amen going to have a, a moment of just reflection invitation and there'll be some folks standing down front here and they'll pray with you and and um, we'll encourage you 
And if you decide you need more encouragement, you want to join the church, see one of us. We, we'd love to talk with you about uh, joining the church and, and starting this growth process with us. Or if we can just pray with you about the future and pray with you about your, what the next chapter of your life or, or what's going on. We love, that's why we're here in the front during this song. Okay? I invite you to come be a part of, of that with us. Let's stand now as we do this in Christ's name.